everybody, I'm Will the Finger Do with This Week in Drag. Here on my side of the globe on Canada's Drag Race, the Queens kick things off with a mini challenge that had the Queens tickle Brooklyn's funny bone on a date. Without a word, the Queens got into Daddy Goes on a Date quick drag. Really? I would have had a word. This was an awkward challenge to watch, but the standouts for me were Irma Gerd's Newfie Heartbreaker, who was an absolute riot. In other news, Dildo Newfoundland is a real place! Look it up. And Vivian Vanderpuss's Australian flute who compared Brooklyn's eyes to water coolers. Seriously. Vivian was so hilarious, I'm not surprised she won the mini challenge. As for this week's maxi challenge, the queens would be lip-syncing RuPaul duets in pairs. Bombay got Troublicious, Shelazon got Chaos, Kimmy got Boom Boom, Giselle got Vivian and Jada Shada and Ermagerd ended up together. Bless. Because she won the mini, Vivian got to assign the songs to the pairs, but because no one would take the only ballad, let the music play, Vivian was forced to assign the songs. She took three hands up for herself and Giselle and then gave I Feel Like Dancing to Team Kimmy Boom. Team Shalea got Adrenaline. Team Jada Irma Shada got peanut butter, which left Team Bombicious with the ballad. Team Bombicious were thrilled. And then the Queens got a lip sync lesson from Brooklyn Heights herself and former flame Miss Vanessa Vanji Mateo. Everyone needed tweaking here and there, but the teams that impressed were Team Kimmy Boom, who danced it out, and Team Jada Irma Shada, who seemed to have the most choreography down. God bless Irma Gerd. That little mayonnaise jar, her words not mine, worked her lid off. Bless. While the queens were getting ready for the runway, Gravelicious tried to apologize to Vivian for being a little dramatic, but Giselle took that moment to tear Gravelicious a new one. Not to say Vivian didn't stand her own ground. Her, I wasn't thinking about you and I encourage you to do the same comment, shut clueless down like a Republican on CNN. It was fantastic. This week on the main stage, Brooke was giving us all kinds of Linda Evangelista metallic belt dress realness. Tracy was giving us some off-the-shoulder feathery drama. Hollywood Jade was serving it with some chartreuse satin. And Ms. Vanji had returned to judge the judgeable. First up, the duets. Team Shaleas went first, and I have to say the biggest problem with this lip sync was there was no cohesion in their looks, which... I felt distracted from their performance. Team Kimmy Boom did a great job. They danced it out right up until the music stopped. Here's to Kimmy Boom. Really? I can't even have a mocktail? And then it was time for the ballad. <laughs> I will say this. Either my standards lowered or they got better. But by the end of their song, I wasn't mad at it. Team Jada Irma Shada got out the peanut butter next. And let's just say there were no allergic reactions to report. Both queens did a great job. Team Pullapus was my fave of the bunch, mostly because it was such a great song. Don't tell Gradualicious I said that. And then it was time for the runway. Category is sleeves. Jada got a finger due for her stunning gold bomber jacket made out of watches. Of course she did. Irma Gerd looked like a Tim Burton design for his movie Coraline, which is a long way to go to say finger due. Miss Revealian Alicious gave us an awkward reveal before showing off her circus clown sleeves. Figure do. Bombay was a clear winner of this runway with this nod to 90s hair shows. Figure do for Bombay, just saying. Even if it hadn't been a nod to her culture, Shelazon's ribbon dress was stunning. Give that girl a figure do, seriously. Chaos came out in a two piece and then removed most of it to reveal a sheer gown with gossamer sleeves, which I totally gave a finger due to. Vivian Vanderpuss's runway was so odd and weird and original and funny that, well, I gave her a finger due right off the top, I'm just saying. Giselle Lullaby seemed to be thinking along the same lines as Miss Vanderpuss. Giselle's extra long arms were stunning because they gave us all that extra sleeve to look at. Finger due for Giselle. Kimmy Couture's runway, although hard to see and a tad overshadowed by some of the previous looks, still got a finger due for me. Lady Boom Boom was lost, and her never-ending sleeve sweater was gorgeous. Figure due, and, well, a little help for Lady Boom Boom. 
Then Brooklyn announced that the top four queens were Jada Shada Hudson, Irma Gerd, Kimmy Couture, and Lady Boom Boom. But the winner this week was Miss Jada Shada Hudson. The queens who landed in the bottom were Soulcalicious and Shelazon LaRue. So it was down to the two TikTok stars lip syncing to Kreisha Turner's Don't Call Me Baby. They seemed pretty evenly matched off the top, neither of them whipped out any big moves, but there was a hypnotic quality to Clownalicious. She seemed to really get into the song. Not that Chelazon didn't do a great job, she just got outshot by the clown. So when the music died, it was Miss Clownalicious who shantayed, and sadly, it was Chelazon LaRue who sashayed away. Canada's Drag Race airs Thursday nights. Check your local listings. And to see my full review of Canada's Drag Race, click on the link up above or in the description box down below. South of my borders here in Canada on the finale of RuPaul's Drag Race All-Stars All-Winners Edition, the queen herself, RuPaul, kicked the week off with a few, well written by other people, words of encouragement for the queens and a Soul Train style dance party, which was a pleasant distraction. In other news, Pleasant Distraction is my pet name for Bruno. <laughs> what? It was a good thing the Queens got some R&R &R in because all of a sudden it was Smackdown time. I thought Rue looked stunning, although that feathery dress triggered my allergies just a titchy touch, I'm just going to say. The Queens walked the runway one more time, and even though there was no category this week, if there were, it would have been suck on this eleganza because every Queen served it on that runway. Seriously. Jada was dripping in glamour and rhinestones in her classic nod to vintage Hollywood, finger due for Jada. Raja's runway was jaw-dropping as per usual, so finger due for Raja, as per usual. Vivi was as stunning as she ever was, but I feel like she had better runways this season. Her makeup wasn't its usual display of perfect blending, and that dress ate up her figure. Still, on her worst day, Vivian looks better than most of us on our best day, so I gave her a finger due, seriously. Evie's tiered cake dress with frosting wig and candy lips look good enough to eat. Good thing I wasn't in the room. Finger due. Jinx's Valkyrie Warrior Witch Ensemble wasn't just unexpected. It was gorgeous. Finger due for Jinx. Monet's exploration into African futurism was beyond stunning. It was art. Finger due for Monet. And the simplicity and color of Shay's runway was beyond delicious, so I totally gave her a finger due too. Proving why she's one of my favorites, Trinity had bejazzled everything and then draped the soft pink taffeta wrap over it, which I thought deserved a finger due. There was a slightly forced moment when Rue shared a few emotional words that got everyone in their feels, and then Monet thanked Rue on behalf of all drag race queens for the opportunities the show had provided for them. Did anyone else feel themselves steering through that? And then it was SmackDown time. Competing for the title of the Queen of She Done Already Done Had Hers is Jada, Raja, Vivian, and Evie took to the stage as Calix spun the big wheel. And the first duo was Vivi and Evie Oddly. They had to lip sync to Salt and Peppa's Push It. I thought both queens did a good job, but Evie busted out all her fave dance moves, which Sadly, overshadowed Vivi's more comic route and secured Evie the win for round one. Then Jada and Raja had to lip sync to Denise Williams' Let's Hear It For The Boy. Both queens kept it simple and stayed true to the lyrics, but I felt like Raja served a little more face. So, when the music died, I wasn't surprised that it was Raja who moved on to the final round against Evie Oddly. Then, the top four queens took to the stage for their first lip sync Lollapalooza round for the Queen of All Queens. The big wheel landed on Jinx, and her opponent was Shea Coulee. They would be lip-syncing to Lady Gaga's Judas. I think both queens did well, but I feel like all the cards were stacked in Jinx's favor, from what she was wearing to the song itself. But I won't lie, it was still a big surprise to me that Jinx out lip synced Shea Coulee. Just me? Then Monet and Trinity took to the stage. Conveniently, bragging rights would be had. The Twitters from All Stars 4 would be lip-syncing to Pink's So What. Because of what she was wearing, I would have said this was Trinity's to lose. But then, Monet's a brilliant performer who gave it her all and effortlessly took the win. And then, it was the She Done Already Done had Herza's finale with Raja and Evie. Their song, Sisters Are Doing It For Themselves by the Eurythmics and Aretha Franklin. Almost right away, Evie's wig came off. Or so it seemed. With one tug of her wig cap, Evie revealed a sassy red pussycat wig underneath, which the judges ate up. 
But when the music died, as far as Uru was concerned, the winner of $50,000 in the title, if she done already done had hers, is, was Raja, who got just a little verklempt over it all, I'm just going to say. And then it was on to the lip sync smackdown for the crown. Before things got started, Rue announced that they would be taking into consideration not just the lip sync, but the Queen's performance throughout season seven, which I thought was Rue's way of letting Monet down easy because when the music died, Rue announced that the winner of Rue Paul's Drag Race All Star 7 All Winners Edition, the Queen of All Queens, was Jinx Monsoon. Personally, I'd like to congratulate all the queens and the crew of RuPaul's Drag Race All-Stars 7 All-Winners Edition for such brilliant work that helped make for fantastic TV. Seriously. Now, across the pond and over the channel on Drag Race France, Nikki Doll had a surprise for the five remaining queens. Puppets! Because everybody loves puppets, as long as they're not possessed by the devil and trying to eat your soul. Just think. You know the drill. One by one, the queens pick their victims. I mean puppets. Bertha got her favorite person in the world, Lolita. I'm predicting a bitter portrayal is all I'm saying. Soa got Paloma. Lolita got Damie Longlegs. Seriously. I LOL'd when I saw that puppet. God bless. Paloma got what I thought was a fat kid eating chocolate, but it was production's attempt to put a beard on the Bertha puppet. Hey, at least they tried. And finally, GD got a Soa mermaid puppet. Why well, gotta be a mermaid? Was Soa's query. Once they had prettied up their puppets, the show began. Bertha was first, and as I expected, she was far too mean to be funny. She actually made a couple of the queens uncomfortable. In other news, viewers are starting to think Bertha's a bitch. Okay, it's just me. But I can't say... Soa's puppet Paloma was a kinder, gentler performance. In fact, the only thing Soa could really make fun of Paloma about was one of her boys popping out of her thong during the lip sync always that one. Paloma acted far kinder and funnier with her Bertha puppet than the real Bertha has been, well, this whole season. For someone who was just accused of never shutting up, Lolita had nothing funny to say with her GD puppet. Which, I, I'm sorry, shocked me. That shocked me. And finally, GD insulted the hell out of Soa with her puppet, which is how it should be. When the puppet show was over, Nikki declared Paloma the winner of the mini-challenge, which came in handy for this week's Maxi Challenge. The queens would be creating their own perfume ad campaign, and Paloma would get to assign them a box from which to create their odiferous offerings. Seeing as there was no way to know what was in the boxes, Paloma just doled them out by trying to match the queens to the packaging. That's what I would have done. Once that was sorted, the queens got into their boîtes. Paloma was thrilled with her champagne flute, red feather boa, and sunglasses. Bertha had issues, I'm surprised, with her contents. She got a rainbow unicorn hairband to keep her hair out of her eyes and a plethora of rainbow accoutrement that didn't really inspire her at all. So as bamboo boat contained all manner of items found in nature if they were made of fun fur and stuffed. GD's leather box came as advertised, full of fetish gear that GD felt restricted her creativity. I just don't think she's trying hard enough. Finally, the only way Lolita's box could have suited her more with its pink perfume themed items would have been if she picked them out herself. And then it was time for the queens to film their ad campaign. Soa seemed to do well until she started choking. That'll teach her to work with the pit crew. GD was doing well until she realized she'd forgotten her perfume bottle along with a lot of her lines. The best thing about Paloma's ad was the rainbow dress she was wearing. Well, that's not true. Paloma also had a wardrobe change or two, and who doesn't love that? But the best part was her talking about the fact that the prop cocktail she had was from her own home. She travels with it. I thought she kept grabbing the same prop off the props table. Seriously. Can I take a sip from a fake cocktail? Lolita's concept had a lot of elements to it, and by elements, I mean dressing up the pit crew in quick drag. Well, that's one way to guarantee you're the cutest. Bertha seemed to make good use of her pit crew member by having him plunge his cocktail down her throat. You heard me. What? And then it was elimination day. As the queens prettied up, they lamented the difficulties in trying to make a living from drag in France. 
Bertha shared that she became a full-time drag queen when she was diagnosed with cancer five years ago. Thankfully, Bertha's in remission now, but I would like to point out that the only person in that workroom who crossed the floor to give her a hug was Lolita. I'm just saying. On the main stage, Nikki was rocking a patent leather bustier and yellow satin skirt. Joining Kitty Smiles and Daphne Berkey at the judges' table were fashion designer Alexandre Matusi and artist and model Iso. Category is Au Couture Creations. GD was first in a stunning black gown topped with a John Galliano hat. Finger do. <laughs> Miss Chunky Heels was next in a cream colored caftan and not much else except a size 4 dress in the same color sewn to the front. I thought this look was too simple, but the message was impactful, so I gave Bertha a finger do. There was nothing about Lolita's runway that I liked, mostly because it wasn't haute couture in my opinion. Why the pink cushion hat? Why the stilt? Why did I give it a finger don't? If you have to ask, we can't be friends. So a Demuse looked gorgeous in a black leather fantasy, but I have to say the star of her show was that blouse and wig combo. Finger do for Zoa. And finally, we had Paloma rocking her best Erte recreation. I was so impressed that I was worried a finger do wouldn't be enough, so I gave Paloma a finger fest. <laughs> you hurt me. <laughs> and then it was time for the perfume ads. GD's perfume for all reasons psh, psh, was okay. It wasn't great. It wasn't the worst. Bertha's Cliché by Maria commercial was next, and I, for one, wish it hadn't been. I just didn't get it. Who's Maria? Is that Bertha's middle name? Is she selling someone else's perfume? In other news, I was filled with questions. Lolita's pitch for Lolita Coquine took forever to get to, and by the time she got there, I didn't care anymore. Lolita lamented that she still hadn't won a challenge. In other news, doesn't look like she's going to win one this week either. Seriously. The problem with Soa's perfume is that I couldn't forget its name, Kunia, <laughs> probably because she said it a thousand times. And clearly, they saved the best for last. Paloma's Arnak ad had me at the line, you suck and everyone knows it. Paloma's commercial was funny, smart, and there were costume changes. In other news, if I had a drink right now, I'd be cheersing Paloma. I'm just saying! On the main stage, Nikki asked the queens who should go home tonight. GD, Bertha, Soa, and Paloma all said Lolita. Lolita had a hard time saying a name, but eventually said Bertha. In other news, that poor little peanut Lolita was crushed, bless. Drag Race France's winner this week was Paloma, no surprise there, and landing in the bottom was Lolita and Bertha. They had to lip sync to Iso's core. To call this lip sync emotional would be an understatement. By the end of the song, Lolita had shaved her head, Bertha was naked, and everyone was in tears. But someone had to sashay away, and surprisingly, this week, it was Bertha, which was another emotional moment as Drag Race France bid its sixth queen farewell. Drag Race France airs Thursday nights. Check your local listings. And finally, on the other side of the world, Drag Race Down Under premiered with the cast making its way into the workroom. The puns, the cattiness, the drag. Panaconda was first into the workroom and had an uneventful entrance. The same can't be said for Faux Fur, who had to redo her entrance two or three times before she got it right. Although truth be told, Faux didn't really need to make an entrance. Her voice did that for her, seriously. Spanky Jackson and her legs were next into the workroom. If Spanky looks familiar to you, it's because she won the last season, there were only two, of House of Drag, hosted by Anita Wiglet and Keita Mean. It's the same season that Electra from Drag Race Down Under season one was on and didn't win. So I'm expecting Spanky to take no prisoners and to not cover her legs. Beverly Kills, the youngest queen of the season, was next into the workroom and she intended to whip the queens into shape, literally. From the youngest to the oldest, it was Minnie Cooper next into the workroom. Already a legend in Australia and New Zealand, Minnie had the other queens sweating through their tucking panties. Personally, I wasn't worried. Just because you've been around the block a few times doesn't mean you know how to build a house, and I worry for these more mature queens being forced to interact with children. Remember Charlie Hyde? Doesn't always work out well. Seriously. Molly Poppins was next into the workroom wearing my two favorite colors, but I need to say, her transformation is remarkable. That said, I'm expecting the other queens to underestimate her. 
The queen with my fave name of the season, Yuri Guy, made a breathtaking entrance, looking like Drag Race Roadkill in all her red sequins. Needless to say, some of the other queens were put off. Okay, just for fur. Pamara Fifth was eighth into the workroom, looking gorgeous in a pink wig and busting forth with New Zealand pride. In other news, New Zealand is often referred to as the Canada of the South Seas. I'm just saying. Next into the workroom was my second favorite name of the season, Aubrey Have, looking almost too good for color TV. The other queens were gagged to learn that Aubrey had taught herself drag during lockdown, which means she's only been doing drag for about a year. Let the judgment parade begin. Making the best entrance into the workroom was the stunning Queen Kong, wearing a King Kong hand wrap. Finger dues all around. Needless to say, this was another queen whose reputation preceded her. And then Rue showed up to welcome the queens and dispel the rumor that Rue was CGI'd into last season's show by proving she was there for this season. How'd she do that? By smacking the hell out of Spanky Jackson. How else? Rue also had some good news. The cash prize for this season is almost double what it was for season one. It went from 30000 to 50000 Australian dollars. So, without further ado, it was time for this week's mini challenge. A sausage sizzle photo shoot. One by one, the queens posed with wieners in their mouths. Let the fellatio innuendo parade begin. This went as well as one could expect, but when the paparazzi fled the scene, it was Ms. Minnie Cooper who presented the best meat pose. You heard me. Then, after an intro video from Bindi and Robert Irwin, it was maxi challenge time. The queens had to make an outfit from the outback and beyond. They had to create custom couture looks out of plants and recyclable materials. Needless to say, this first challenge had more than a few of these queens worried. After a mad grab for materials, the queens got down to it by getting out of drag. I loved hearing 50-year-old Minnie Cooper talking about growing up in a time when you didn't see gay stuff on TV. I'm 55, and I have to say, here in Canada, we had a lot of gladiator movies to watch. But then, mind you, there were only three TV channels, though. So. Spanky, the next oldest at 35, noticed that some of the younger queens were being dismissive with Minnie. She made a good point. It's queens like Minnie Cooper who've made it possible for these baby drags to learn drag during lockdown. I just want to say there was a lot of hot glue going on in that room, but then there were a lot of unsewable materials going on in that room as well. Seriously. Wheat? As the queens got ready for the runway, I loved how judgy Beverly Hills was over the skill sets of some of the other queens. She hated Spanky's blue cyborg moth and was stunned that Minnie Cooper doesn't know how to sew at all. She didn't like what Hanaconda, Faux Fur, or Molly Poppins were selling either. Did I mention she's the youngest? On the main stage, RuPaul wore something I'm sure she'd read any other queen for if they wore it. Seriously, did she just get out of the shower? Back to Judge the Judgeable were the ultra glamorous this week, Michelle Visage and that cute ginger imp, Reese Nicholson. Category is Down Under Naturally. Up first was Beverly Kills in a gorgeous party dress made out of plastic bags. And it looked like that. She should be able to read anyone she wants. Seriously, finger do. Hannah Conda's Forest Fairy was next, and I for one thought she looked gorgeous, so I gave her a finger do. Minnie Cooper's stapled runway look was chic. Finger do for Minnie. Who cares if she can't sew? Aubrey Have looks super cute in a denim onesie. I don't know if Soa's decision to change her runway to look last minute was a good or a bad thing because, well, we really didn't get a good look at it in the first place. I just saw a linen caftan, but this look, well, it wasn't my favorite. Still, I gave it a finger do. Speaking of my favorite, Spanky Jackson wasn't wearing it. <laughs> finger don't. Seriously, all that fabric in those, what were they, wings, and she couldn't come up with a skirt? This isn't House of Drag, Spanky! Molly Poppins looked adorable in her, as she showed the judges, bushy fairy look. Or, should I call it a bushy finger do? No? Oh, good. Beaufort's wheatgrass look would have been fine if she'd worn a thong or something, but that big black pair of panties was not worthy of a finger do, I'm just going to say. Pomora Fifth's mossy swimsuit was an instant finger do, and not because of that big, beautiful chapeau. In other news, Mossy Swimsuit was my drag queen name in high school. 
Yuri Guy's runway was so unique, mostly because, well, she couldn't walk in it. But whenever she stood still, she took my breath away. Figure do for Yuri, just saying. The queens in the top were Hannah Conda, Molly Poppins, and, well, despite her dress's impracticality, Yuri Guy. I have to say, there was a moment during the judges' critique that I just loved. When Yuri said her dress was sewing, and the judges said, do you mean sewn? I love that Yuri threw her parents under the bus by declaring she was homeschooled. She does have a point. Back in the Untucked Lounge, it was an emotional bouillabaisse. Spanky was crying because she was clearly in the bottom. Aubrey tried to justify herself out of the bottom by declaring that, well, at least her outfit was sewing. To which Minnie Cooper said that sewn or not, Aubrey's outfit was still ill-fitting. In other news, that went over well. Back on the main stage, the winner of the week was, surprise, surprise, Molly Poppins. In the bottom this week were Spanky Jackson and Faux Fur. They lip-synced to Kylie Minogue's Get Out of My Way. I feel like both queens were evenly matched, but when Spanky dropped into the splits, the judges were stunned into silence or worried that she'd hurt herself. But Spanky got right back up and threw it down. And when the music stopped, it was Spanky Jackson who shantayed. And sadly, it was the queen that roared, faux fur, who sashayed away. What do you think about season two so far? Any better than season one? Too soon to tell? Drag Race Down Under airs Saturday nights. Check your local listings. I'm Wilma Fingerdew, and until next week, that was this week in drag. I hope you were too. Mwah!